everybody. Let's go ahead and start. Welcome to the Open Research Institute's FPGA meetup this week. And I have a report uh, to read in from, from Aaron, uh, uh, AI5BAB. And what we do at this meeting is we talk about what we have done, uh, what we plan to do, and we uh, share if there's any roadblocks uh, or anything um, that we need, any resources that we need. And uh, Aaron describes, he says he has a meeting that, and not able to join. Um, and below is his updates from the from the last week. So his accomplishments are, he created an example application to reproduce his test setup with OpenCPI and documented how to run, in, run them. Um, these include transmit uh, PRBS MSK mod, transmit PRBS MSK mod received to file, transmit PRBS MSK mod receive to demod or demodulate, and created a new application to test MSK mod to MSK demod in FPGA only mode. And he continues, this version is oversampled at 100 megahertz, no errors, and this is without going to the AD9363. He double-checked the integrity of the AD9363 data interface, uh, ruling out the interface, introducing errors on PRBS sync or synchronization. And he created a project to install the OpenCPI development environment that targets the Pluto. So Aaron is very involved with the Open CPI uh, project. So uh, it's really nice uh, to have him. He's, he's been involved with with ORI for a couple of years, and uh, is introduced Open CPI uh, to us uh, and given a, a brief rundown in the past. Uh, might be time to to do that again. What he plans on doing is to write scripts to build artifacts and reproduce the package uh, from source uh, that he distributed, and to continue trying to make OpenCPI compatible with every version of the firmware. He wants to write a simple application to compute bit error rate, an example C++ API that you can use with OpenCPI. And he's going to test setting the AD9363 and digital loopback to see the results of the PRBS sync without going all the way to, to RF. He's going to test receiving on another radio. Uh, maybe there needs to be a frequency or carrier offset for the algorithm to work. It's a question. Um, and doesn't explain FPGA only results. He's thinking about testing the IP cores being clocked by 100 megahertz and how they somehow pass valid or enable to them. This would allow using existing components after or before mod and demod, like decimators, interpolators, and mixers. As current setup takes one sample per clock, and that's how it currently gets clocked. Um, the I of open CPI stands for infrastructure. There are DMA or direct memory access paths available to use. Uh, and it was mentioned in the last meeting about possibly adding some additional debug points, and he says he can help expose those. And he had a question. He was looking at the Trello boards, and it mentioned uh, implementations of FSK for FSK for Opulent Voice. And so I explained that that was the original design and that we had uh, adapted uh, or moved from 4 FSK uh, to uh, to minimum shift keying to MSK. And uh, they were checked off as complete. Yes, do these exist? So I pointed him at the repository for the C++ code uh, for, for that implementation. That's the implementation that was used this past weekend by the University of Puerto Rico on the uh, sounding rocket launch for Rocksat X. And he asked if there's still an interest in getting these working. So that's a good question as to, to whether or not he'd like to invest time to do that earlier implementation as well, or just move on with MSK, I would think the latter would be okay. Uh, it would be fine to just uh, you know start with the minimum shift keying implementation because there's lots of advantages to this modulation scheme. And then you ask for Hyferia, what's driving the need to use um, the ADRV 9009? 9009 is a, a pretty 
big and capable chip. Uh, so the it's a valid question. You know, the band plans it calls for the 40.96 mega samples per second for a, what this is for a 20 megahertz um, plan or or spot in the band plan uh, and that you don't have to use such a heavyweight chip and that's true so so I answered that in slack uh, that that sh you know whichever way achieves a good board for us after we prove out our demonstrations in the lab uh, prove it out on the Pluto which is a excellent target in and of itself uh, but that the reason for the 9009 is that we we don't want to be limited to the 40.96 mega samples per second. We do want to take advantage of the larger bandwidths and larger allocations and the different band plans that are on um, 24 gig and 47 gig. And also we're technically not really limited to 20 megahertz on on 10 gigahertz. We can expand and and use more. Um, it's a voluntary band plan that we have for 10 gigahertz and because of the localized and point-to-point -point nature of 10 gigahertz we actually can um, if, it, if it if a whole system is capable we don't hit a, a bottleneck or anything like that um, with this larger chip we can we can have a larger bandwidth so that was that was the the answer um, that that I gave and we could talk about that more uh, but there's nothing stopping us from from implementing um, our own hardware with the 9361 or the 9364, and he recommends that we might be able to use two ICs, one for transmit and one for receive, so they can be independently tuned. Um, okay, so that's the report from, from Aaron that's read in. Um, and now we will go go to our, our round table here. I'd like to thank everybody for the time and, and effort and energy on this. Uh, so Everest, you have the floor. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much for the report. Um, just a quick update. Uh, I wasn't available last week. I just uh, work uh, this weekend. Uh, trying to uh, reproduce uh, the OpenCPI uh, example, which is uh, now working. Uh, I would like to have uh, this working on uh, uh, the MSK firmware, but it's not the case right now. Um, and last time, uh, before trying OpenCPI, um, I have some outputs RF. Um, so just with the the the, the implementation of the on, uh, well the firmware. Uh, without the OpenCPI, um, but I have only uh, the carriers uh, which can be programmed uh, by MQTT, and I can see that the <clears throat> the the frequency the the NCO is working, uh, but even uh, I send some data or PRBS. There is no modulation, so I suspect that there is a problem uh, on the DMA, and uh, I have to investigate on that and maybe um, reintegrate the component uh, CPAC uh, from ADI. Um, that's a suspicion, but uh, we have to uh, discuss may maybe. Uh, together to uh, to debug all that. That's uh, that's it for me. Okay, thank you so much. That's a that's a a big amount, um, and I, I recognize the uh, the problem. I think that in in previous efforts to to use our our stations in the lab, that that we have had some. We've had some success with DMA, but we've also had some some troubles. It's tricky. So over the next week, we'll uh, focus on that and and try to get some some progress. I'm really excited about the MQTT uh, angle, and it sounds like that at least the um, the access to the firmware and you're you're able to actuate and make some changes uh, with with MQTT, and that's a that's a big step forward. That's going to really help the usability for this to be something that can be 
uh, programmed and operated uh, remotely. That's that's exciting to 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 many people. So thank you. Is there anything uh, besides the help with the uh, with getting it to actually modulate? Um, is there anything that specifically that you need? Mm, I think uh, maybe uh, some uh, some documentation on the register. It is already well documented. Um, some some uh, register is a little uh, confused for me, uh, and so maybe we we can have found some more detail on Slack and uh, have uh, a clear documentation. But it's uh, it's okay. Awesome. Okay. All right. I've, I've I'll take that down as an action item. Um, I know that that we went from from hand editing the the documentation of the register table, uh, and that there's a really nice way to kind of extract it um, in a more automated way. So I'm I'm also looking forward to to learning how to do that so I can help help keep the documentation up to date. So so thank you thank you very much. Okay. So uh, let's see. How about Matthew? You have you have the floor. Okay, thank you. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, every what you got accomplished here and what um, sorry, I'm not so good with names sometimes, but KI five BAB, um, what what you guys have accomplished? So the open CPI and and uh, getting the spectrum coming out on the uh, Pluto. So this is, I think, really good work. I'm really excited about it. Um, and, and I I think that I missed one of uh, KI5BAB's points uh, regarding um, the spectral output. He, he was concerned about the, the two lobes being transmitted. And um, I, I was thinking that, that it was where when he sent out the... Um, the initial images or of the of the output spectrum some weeks ago um i was thinking more just in terms of uh and he had kind of said this that you know the negative frequency versus the positive frequency we're getting a lobe on each and at the time i didn't really think much of that i, I you know because it's not really truly a problem um but in the in the, what you just sent ever east um I think I was realizing more what he might have been getting at. So in, in what you demonstrated here, we have a center frequency about 410 with, um, you know, at the main lobe at 411 and the, and another lobe uh, mirrored it at like 408-ish. Four, um, and so th this is what you would expect in mixing up from, uh, you know, a IF or a baseband signal that you would get the the mirrors. And so typically you would, you know, bandpass filter uh, uh, one of the lobes, the one that you want, or you could even in this case, maybe low pass filter the, the lower lobe uh, or even high pass the upper lobe. Um, but you you would have to do some sort of filtering to remove the other, uh, the mirror image. But uh, I think he was suggesting that if we, did an IQ modulation rather than putting out a real modulation uh, that you can you can effectively uh, cancel one of the lobes, right? So um, because you're multiplying one by a sine, one by a cosine, the the negative frequency of the cosine is negative versus uh, the or the sine is negative versus the cosine being positive. So you end up um, in the IQ modulation canceling out uh, one of these which can work, but the, the difficulty with it, of course, is that, that your IQs have to be balanced properly in order uh, to get a good image rejection. So that, that's something we could uh, potentially look at. I mean, I, it's not something I think we need to, um, you know, I, I think we have a, pro a path forward right now, uh, just, you know, using this that, that we can that is still beneficial, but that we we have a lot more progress to make. And then there are certain things that we can go back and and look at. And one would be maybe doing an IQ modulation rather than um, putting out the real signal. And because, you know, that might simplify the RF design a little bit. Um, and then, you know, there's some other 
things that and for other reasons I've been reading a lots and lots and lots of papers recently and but I've come across a couple um, for MSK specifically related to like non-coherent detection and there was another paper I'll have to find it again I have so many I've, I've looked at um, that uh, related to MSK demodulation that would um, oh yeah one was using a Kalman filter rather than the Costa sloop and so which might be interesting um, you know the the PID controller or the PI controller for the Costa sloop can be a bit finicky we're seeing that a little bit in trying to find the right um, the right uh, P and I gains. Um, I mean, I, I, you know, we'll get there and it'll work and it'll be stable and robust. But it'd be what's really interesting and with this platform is, you know, we'll have the ability to try other demodulators and and experiment with them and you know under various conditions and and see, you know, and we might even use different demodulators for different use cases. And we'll you know we'll have the ability to experiment with that and try it and try these new things. Um, so I'm I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, so I, I guess I don't really have any particular uh, status. Um, I've been busy with some other things, as I've mentioned in the chat. I was hoping things would um, slow up a little bit this week, but they haven't yet, because I, I really want to get back to getting the Costa Sloop working and locked. Um, but that will come. And then... Yeah, anytime, Michelle, you want to, you know, we can talk about the system RDL concepts and, and, um, you know, be, I think it's a really powerful approach. Um, yeah, I think there's some rough edges that, you know, we might, you know, maybe we could put some effort into smooth out. But um, I, I love that kind of automation when it's, um, when it works well, um, because it really reduces um, levels of effort. Um, and just was thinking if there was anything else. To bring up, I mean, you know, the. Um... Well, I think the the one thing I'd bring up is is that that what you've discussed about the modularity and being able to experiment. This this goes back to your proposal for the 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 platform essentially, or the modem proposal that you made, and I think you know following through with that and 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 sort of maintaining our our commitment to uh, you know modular approach and and a sort of a, a discipline about that, I think it'll it'll definitely pay off. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so you know, the, the things that, that we're discussing and, and the ability to have some agility in, in looking at different uh, solutions, uh, it all goes back to the, the work done previously to, to make sure that we have a, a you know, a, a analytical sort of you know, a commitment to to the underlying flexibility of the framework. Uh, so the modem framework that you proposed, I think, is paying off, uh, and and we should definitely um, you know keep keep at it and and see it see it through. Yeah, I mean, I was really impressed uh, with with Open CPI that KF5BAB. I'm sorry, I don't know his name. I I should I apologize. Aaron. Um, Aaron, thank you. Uh, yeah, I've looked at a, his status or his. Uh, thing a couple of times, but I, I sometimes have difficulties with names. So, but yeah, they are, the work Aaron did with it, open CPI is just to me really impressive. He was able to take the modem and integrate it to this entirely different top level, you know, um, in short order. So um, one, I think it speaks to the modularity, the benefit of the modularity that he was able to do that. But two, you know, that, that, you know, the work that he did there is, is very impressive and useful and, you know, whether or not we, choose to use open CPI or not, or continue with ADI firmware, you know, we, 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 we can learn from it certainly. And I think we already are. So that's really good. Um, I, I did drop a, a few other comments in the, in the FPGA channel, um, which, you know, I won't bring up here, but I mean, I, that there's maybe a little bit of, um, well, it might be a little effusive, but on the other hand, um, you know, some of the points you brought up, I, I think, that the the opportunity for this modem and you know to build on it to to um and and the usefulness of it as a as a learning platform for new people and people wanting to learn more about modems and modulations and that sort of thing is you know there's a lot here not just in the practicality of this modem but in in using it as 
um, re a research tool and as an educational tool. Um, you know, I, I'm really excited about what opportunities that we haven't even envisioned yet that that can come from this. So, um, anyways, as as we go forward, uh, you know, continuing to uh, make this a real thing, um, I think the you know, I'm glad to see that we're working on the RF paths and the DMA paths because we need to get those working, of course. And then, um, but my focus will continue to be getting the um, the clock recovery loops, the synchronization loops stable and and repeatable um, in terms of, of um, you know, and digital loop back, just getting those solid. And um, um, yeah, so, and, and we certainly had help on that um, as well. Uh, so that'll just keep going. So that'll be my focus once I'm able to get some of this other stuff that's uh, uh, nagging me put put aside. Um, so that's it. Thank you. Oh, very good. No, thank you for all the the time and effort. Deeply appreciated. Uh, so let's go to uh, let's go to Ken. I think you have some some things to report and that you might need some some help here. So uh, Ken, you have the floor. Yeah, um, not really any progress to report again. I've got uh, a couple paths I've been trying to uh, push forward on. We uh, got the uh, tools installed on Windows and have been trying to compile the um, just the plain vanilla reference uh, reference code again in for the ADRV 9009, um, the, the NOAA, NOAA OS build. And currently struggling with some sort of error that seems to be path variable related. When I sourced the uh, setting 64.sh, um, I get a message saying the system cannot find the path specified over and over again in my make. Um, so trying to get some debug on that and then trying to go back uh, just to keep the balls in the air with the, uh, the other approaches is gone back to Choco Cat and trying to just run the uh, vanilla uh, ADRV 9009 no OS compile there. I think it's building there again. Um, it's been a while since since I looked on, on this side, so I need to see what, what the stumbling block was. I know that we, after we had trouble with Choco Cat, we tried to go with uh, Nuts and uh, there was one other server in the on the way there <laughs> that we had tried some other variants of of Linux and stuff. So just trying to go back and get the the basics working on the on that front to, to just push on on multiple things. And then we may go back all the way to the uh, Petal Linux if none of these pan out. So just gonna keep trying. But that's about it. Yeah, thank you. And just to to summarize, so so what uh, what Ken's trying to do is to take the uh, polyphase filter channelizer. This is the receiver on the uh, on the payload or the ground sat or satellite. Uh, so this receives all of the many frequency, division, multiple access channels uh, that we're creating with Opulent Voice. And, um, you know, and, and that code is uh, is pretty solid. It works. It's uh, Theseus Cores is the the project. It's an open source uh, project. And they their implementation of the sort of the polyphase channelizer, very good. And they've been extremely supportive and active and helping. Uh, so what we're trying to do is is take that logic and put it into the design on the payload side um, and get it to work. So when we're looking at using Petalinux as the the main way to to kind of uh, interface with the hardware and 
that had a lot of problems with API mismatches and profile configurations not working. And so we dropped back to a bare metal approach, which is the no OS uh, approach that, that Ken's referring to. And this has had its own different problems. A change is as good as a rest. So we've learned an awful lot and there will be a path forward. Just all of these frameworks and all the errors are kind of par for the course, uh, integrating all of this with the you know, multiple companies and multiple frameworks and and a large amount of logic is is difficult. So there there has been progress, but we don't have a working uh, design quite yet. So looking forward to the next week. I'll be able to help. And uh, and thank you, Ken, for all the hard work. I know it's uh it can be frustrating to to have this happen. Um, but the underlying code base is fantastic, and um, you know. Ken's working from one side and the opulent voice folks are working from the other. And when it when it meets in the middle, yeah, it's gonna be gonna be pretty, pretty remarkable. So so thank you very much for all of your work. All right. And so uh, Paul, tell us how Remote Labs is going. Uh, I think there's been some upgrades and uh, uh, possibly some some news there. So you have the floor. Howdy. Well, fortunately, Remote Labs has taken care of itself uh, automatically for the last two weeks, which is very good because the first most of a week we spent going to DEF CON and showing off some stuff, including a poster for Opulent Voice related to the, the Rocksat launch. And then the, the second week was taken up by for, for me personally by recovering from the case of COVID. I got at DEF CON, so I'm just coming out of that now. Hopefully... Uh, be back up to full speed shortly. As a result, the the upgrade hardware is still on my desk rather than in the lab and installed in the server. So we don't have anything to report on that yet. Um, the repair is still holding solid and seems to be keeping things at the status quo ante. Um, hopefully I'll have more to report soon if we find uh, a service interval where we can bring the system down and install the new hardware for, for the upgrade. I believe that's all I have to report today. Okay. Well, thank you. And um, uh, just to, to recap a little bit of DEF CON, uh, we had a, a very successful exhibit and demo. The The main physical demo was uh, Ribbit, one of our projects. And this is a, a early neat uh, a project. Uh, what it what it is currently is a, a web app, so a web application. So if you have a, a device uh, that has a microphone and a speaker and you can get to a web page or, or install this web app locally so that you don't depend on the internet, then you can type in text. It's converted to audio tones um, and the audio tones are protected by, by polar codes, a very powerful forward error correction. And these audio tones can then be played from your device over any radio. So it turns any radio into a digital messaging system. This is good for recreational, tactical, public service, anything where you need, you know, the all of the advantages of digital communications. Um, if you have access to to audio, then then you can you can use it. Uh, and this got a lot of traction and a lot of interest. And the the that demo, the web app, is now live at ribbitradio.org. That's the the site, um, and all of this is uh, uh, free and open source. So that was the main technical demo that we had. Uh, we also talked a lot about Opulent Voice. We had the poster from the University of Puerto Rico. Thank you very much to the students that uh, that did that uh, right before their launch. So on a on quite the schedule. Uh, the launch was successful, and we will hear lots more about that from Oscar and his students uh, through through Slack, and looking. Looking forward to uh, to being able to spread the news about a successful successful launch admission. Uh, we talked about our regulatory work, the uh, ITAR and EAR work for for open source satellites, open source communication satellites, and we also talked about our uh, synthetic aperture radar regulatory work. I gave a presentation about that and RF Village, and it was very well received. So we had a very oh, and then another demo that. Uh, uh, Paul supported was the RF Bitbanger, our HF open source QRP kit with the native digital mode scamp. 
and that mode is now uh, you now can find it in the um, sort of the the beta version of of FL Digi, and it'll be in the mainline code when the uh, owner of FL Digi uh, can can spend the time to incorporate it. Uh, you can get a a copy of the FL Digi with Scamp. Uh, that's that is available, uh, but it's not yet in the mainline download. Um, but the RF Bitbanger was uh, also very well received, got a lot of interest, and uh, and showed that off. Uh, and we also uh, showcased uh, the digital, or sorry, Deep Space Exploration Society and their work uh, with a really big dish out in Colorado. And we promoted their efforts to rehabilitate other dishes and to get that uh, site in Colorado uh, remotely accessible for citizen science, amateur astronomy, and amateur radio. This was a, a good show. So we're very, very happy to be included in RF Village at DEF CON. There was about 30,000 people that attended, and we have tentative agreement to come back uh, for 2025. It'll be at Las Vegas Convention Center West again, and we are a part of the RF Village. So uh, we'll we'll plan for that uh, over the next year. And uh, and. Really appreciate the opportunity and and the success of that particular show. There is uh, some repercussions. Uh, being around so many people can can introduce some illness. So we've all been recovering in various ways from the show. Our next show uh, is not until October. We're looking at Pacificon and our digital update for microwave in Vancouver, British Columbia. So both of those things will be talked about on the list and in uh, on Slack. So if you are able to support or come to those shows, uh, please do. We believe in demonstrating to the public and publishing everything as it's created. And those the demonstrations and being able to interact with people uh, pays back enormous dividends. We're able to do the work that we do because we publish and because we show up and we are a demonstration first organization. So thank you everybody for coming. We're going to, uh, I'll open the floor to any last uh, comments or questions. And um, anybody have anything? Uh, just a quick question, uh, Michelle. Oh, please go uh, ahead. Um, um, why? Maybe it's uh, <laughs> uh, just an idea. Uh, as the, there is a DATV firmware uh, based on the uh, DVBS2 caller from Ori. Why uh, don't you uh, demonstrate it? Oh, that's a really good question. Thank you for the for that question. We did not demonstrate it at this most recent DEF CON because we were limited to one table. And if I had thought about it a little harder, then I think it probably would have been a uh, higher, a little higher priority. So it's 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 not uh, out of neglect or or because we are not proud of it. Uh, but when we we also were down one person, we had a uh, unfortunately had an injury. Uh, one of our volunteers was injured right before DEFCON and could not attend. And if we had additional people, I think that we could have probably scheduled more uh, demonstrations. So uh, it's a good question, and maybe we can, uh, in October, maybe we can show uh, DVBS2 working, so the downlink working, and and show that uh, uh, in in the in the mix. Um, so thank you for that question. Um, so so yeah, we're t with table space. Uh, being being limited, and we can only pack so much into a minivan <laughs> than it was whatever we were most recently working on. So uh, no no slight in intended to any particular project. Uh, for example, like that we didn't take any of the synthetic aperture radar demos with us because the the injured volunteer was was going to bring them. Uh, so we didn't have any of that to show, even though we had a, a talk about it. Um, Plus, we had uncertainty about the venue, including the ability to move equipment from the minivan to the table. Um, we tried to keep it uh, packing light this year to make it more feasible with fewer people. Yeah, that was a big consideration for DEF CON because it was in a completely new venue. Um, 
and that was kind of a surprise to the to the organizers. It was about six months in advance of the date. So for a large conference like this, it was a uh, a somewhat disruptive to have to move from the existing hotels and and conference centers, which had had it for many years, and we were very comfortable and had had a known quantity of space. We were not sure how it was going to go at the Las Vegas Convention Center, and there there was um, some difficulty in setup, uh, which hopefully will not happen again next year, <laughs> as we learn how to to deal with a new venue. Um, so in October, I think that we can we can do a better job of of uh, of having the full lineup. Um, so so hopefully that reassures you uh, and. When we talk about it on on Slack, uh, then I think we can, you know, it, it, we'll do a better job of communicating what we're planning. I think we'll have a better, more higher confidence with Pacificon and and the digital update for Microwave uh, project. And if there's any other show or any other demonstration that we can help support, where this can be sh demonstrated in person, like you can see the power of it, then uh, just just let me know. I'll do all that I can to, to help make it happen. Okay, great. I understand. Yeah, thank you. All right, folks. Uh, see you on Slack. And if there's any uh, anything that you need over the next week or, or any concerns or any reports of success, then just uh, share it on Slack. And we'll see you next week at about the same time.